All right, uh, now again, you, if you, we can see the point of the flowchart because we had to go one, two, three steps. So again, without the flowchart, even if people have all these formulas in their cheat sheet, they don't, it's hard to pick out the right ones to get between these. So it's helpful to have these all in one place because very often, again, a problem is going to take require to go from one place to another. So you might want to ask, where am I starting and where am I going? And then the formulas take you between those places. Okay. So what if, well, we should always, if we're dealing with springs, the K should always be provided, right? Well, let's see. Um, they don't have to provide the K. For example, you could have a problem where they tell you that the frequency mm -hmm. is 8 hertz and the mass is 4 kilograms. And they could ask you for the K. How would you do that? Um, have the frequency, I, I would use the frequency to find omega. Using which equation? Use um, omega equals 2 pi f. So you just do 2 pi times 8. Good. And then I would find K by using um, omega equals the square root of K over m. Right, because we know what m is. All right. So they, they, it's OK if they don't give you one of the variables. Right, and then they, they can ask you for the other ones. Yeah, so they can give you any, uh, they just have to give you enough variables to, that you can have enough equations to use there, basically. So sometimes they might ask you for the spring constant. That's certainly a fair question. Um, also, would they combine this, like, with, say, with, like, work and energy? Because I know that with some of the springs, you're sure. supposed to find A, which is the, the length that the string stretches or can stretch. The amplitude, and right. Then, and then, so... And they would, then they would ask us to find the period of that. Yeah, so let's keep going here then. So what you're talking about is if you know K, you should be able to figure out the spring's potential energy. Mm -hmm. What's the formula that relates these two concepts? Um, one half KX squared. So let's add this to our flow chart. The spring energy, spring u, is 1 half kx squared. So again, we keep writing the concepts on the sides of the arrows, and we're writing the formulas above the arrows. Those show us how to get between those concepts. So if we know k, we can figure out uh, the spring energy here. That's right. Um, yeah, so that's uh, certainly a formula that you might need, uh, need to use uh, to go back and forth between those. That's right. And Let's see here. Again, we would not be using wavelength for a spring. The springs don't have wavelengths, but they have all these other things. And you might also want to find the spring force. Uh, do you remember what's the formula that relates the spring force in K? Although, actually, remember, even though this is the official formula, this is not the formula we usually use. Remember, we just focus on magnitudes. We usually just say that the magnitude of the displacement equals the, uh, times k equals the magnitude of the spring force. So, uh, like you know, I like to use a dot to indicate magnitudes. So we can use the dots here to show that these are the magnitudes. Um, so technically, the spring force is negative kx, but it's probably more convenient just to find the magnitude, because it should be pretty obvious to us what the direction is of the spring force. What would be the direction of the spring force here? To the left. Yeah. Um, so if, uh, if to the right was our positive direction, then the spring force here would be negative. So the point is, we don't need this formula to figure out the sign on the spring force. This is just going to confuse us. It's better just to say k times x is the magnitude, and then we can figure out on our own whether the spring force is positive or negative. So this is the formula we usually use. In fact, I think I'll erase this because we usually don't use that. We just say the magnitude of the spring force is k times the magnitude of x and then we find the sign on our own. It's easy to find the sign based on your common sense. If you've expanded the spring, the spring is trying to contract. If you pull the spring to the left, the spring, I'm sorry, if you pull the spring to the right, the spring forces to the left. And if you push the spring to the left, the spring forces to the right. So you can easily add the sign on your own. 
negative kx usually causes uh, beginning students to make mistakes. Okay? By the way, now we can remind ourselves, what are the units for k um. based on this formula? Take your time. How can we use a formula to figure out the units on a variable? Oh, well, force equals newtons. Right. Um, Probably the best thing to do is let's over start. Meters? Yeah, that's right. Newtons over meters. We could solve for k. Mm -hmm. K equals f over x. Well, f is in newtons and x is in meters. So now we can go back and fill in this part of the flowchart that I skipped before. You can see that k really does measure how tight the spring is. Because k could be, say, 8 newtons per meter. That means it takes 8 newtons of force to stretch it 1 meter. And then if k was 16 newtons per meter, that would mean that it took 16 newtons to stretch it 1 meter. Well, this would be a tighter or a stiffer spring. So k is telling you how much force it takes to stretch it 1 meter. So k really is measuring how tight or how stiff the spring is. So these would be two different k's. The lower k means uh, is a lower force per meter, so it's not as tight, not as stiff. And the bigger k is a greater force per meter, so that's different. Okay, good. What does x stand for again? Displacement. Yeah, the displacement from where? Um, from its natural length. Yeah, so on, do you have a picture of this? Can you point out what distance does x measure in that picture? Yeah, that's right. So x would be this distance. It's how far the spring has been stretched from its natural length. So x is not the length of the spring. It's just how different it is from the natural length. It's how much you've stressed or compressed it. So it makes sense that it affects the force. Obviously, the more you stretch the spring, the more the spring force is going to be. And also, the more you stretch the spring, the more energy is stored in it. So it makes sense that x goes into both of those equations over there. OK, so it's good to know what x is. when a spring is stretched five meters, the spring force is 15 newtons. Find the period of the spring if it starts oscillating. Uh, so if you want to, you can solve this numerically, or you can just talk me through how you would do it. Make sure you got that right. So uh, did you get 1.2 for omega? Yes. <clears throat> and what did you get for the frequency? 1.9 hertz. And then the period is? I got 
Yeah, that's right. I wrote down, right? Oh, oh. I thought you wrote down point nine. Did you get point one nine? Um, one point nine. Ah, one of those made a mistake. So let's see here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. right. right, now the problem is Okay, so as you saw, I didn't give you enough information at the start. We need to also know the mass. So we invented this mass of 2 kilograms. So if we know that the mass is 2 kilograms, now we can solve the problem. So here you have the frequency should be 1.2 over 2 pi, right? 